What's up, guys? Welcome back to the FNG Academy. Buck here, former Green Beret. Here to help you get selected. <laughs> <laughs> been a while. Yeah, it's been a minute. A minute. That's cool. All right, guys. So we want to jump on with Kurt here because uh, we're doing a whole trip on beers and breakdowns and start doing some tips. Get back into doing tips on uh, getting selected and you know joining special forces. We've been doing a lot of mentoring. Kurt's got running the mentor program and he's got a ton of uh, advice that he has based on the questions that you guys have been asking in the mentor program. We have the mentorship podcast, uh, the mentorship program, and the tier three. So if you just want to support the channel or if you just want exclusive content, uh, tier three is also an option. So we created a whole variety of options and ways to help. But obviously the main one is for free on the YouTube channel. So we're always going to keep that free content coming for you guys on the main channel. So today we're going to talk about top tips for passing your two mile run. Right. Yeah, it's a question we get a lot. So a lot of people are concerned about, you know, the first thing you do when you get to selection, when you get to SFAS, is that gate, right? And the first gate is your PT test. If you don't pass that on day zero, essentially, you're not going to go beyond that, you know? Going home immediately. So I know a lot of people, myself included, like I've never been a naturally fast runner. I feel like you were always fast. Were you a naturally fast runner? No. No? Mm -hmm. See, neither was I, and that was something for me I had to work on. So if you guys don't know, when you get to SFAS or Ranger School or whatever else, right, you're graded on the most strict standard. So you have to be able to not only pass, but excel at the 17 to 21-year-old standard if you're in the Army. Mm -hmm. So the 17 to 21-year-old standard, 100% on that is 13 minutes flat mm -hmm. or less. Um, and you know, the, the, min the minimum is like 1636, but ideally, or if you're going to SFAS, you're not even worried about the minimum. No, you want to max it. Yeah. You want to max or get as close to that as you can. Yeah. So like 1310 is good. 1315, right. 1320, but you start getting anywhere past that and it's like, mm. yeah. And so what that does though, is that oh, if you're, if you're lacking on your physical, like your PT test scores, that's something that it's gonna you're gonna have to excel and make up that difference in other ways. So you're already starting off on the back foot because at the end of selection, they're gonna look at everything that you've done mm -hmm. and they're looking like almost like a whole person whole concept, right? Yeah. And so if you're lacking in that, you're gonna have to really step it up in other areas. So So what technique did you use? Because I'm not naturally fast either. Mm -hmm. So what technique I have a specific technique that I'll talk about, but what technique did you use to get fast? So Honestly, I think the, the one thing that helped me out the most was somebody that we went through the Q course with. Um, his name was Blake. And, you know, he ended up going on and, you know, he's in a different unit at this point. Um, but he was an ultra marathoner and he was actually a sponsored runner at one point. And I remember in one of the phases, he started teaching us uh, the pose running technique. Mm. Do you remember yeah, that? I remember that. I remember because it's like that leaning forward. Right. Kind of like. So you're not on your toes kind of thing. So a lot of people, myself included, have adopted this bad running form where you're you're striking with your heel. Mm -hmm. And basically when you do that, every step is like putting on the brakes. So you're constantly having to overcome that. So by cleaning up my form and like he gave us a, a quick rundown on pose running. Then I got the book by Dr. Nicholas Romanov. Awesome book. Um, and so, you know, I picked that up and I started adapting my style or changing my mm -hmm. style. And that's really what helped me not only increase my distance, but also my speed because you get a more efficient running style and you're not using as much energy because mm -hmm. like you said, it's a, a, a constant fall. You're just leaning forward and your legs are now just catching you instead of trying to propel you on yeah. a run. And it's funny because until you brought it up, I didn't, I forgot that I put a lot of time into pose running. Mm -hmm. Like I put a lot of effort into um, watching the videos and like getting the technique down, like with jump roping, mm -hmm. like you yeah. use a jump rope as an example is how you're on your toes and how you want to spring and you have your heel just kiss the ground. Yep. And then, um, yeah, I really focused on trying to get that. So I felt like I was just falling forward mm -hmm. and now I don't realize it, but yeah, that's been part of my running technique ever since. Yeah. So if I look back at some of my old running shoes, it would be like the heel was completely worn out. Mm -hmm. And now, like, all my newer running shoes over the past few years, it's more, like, on the midfoot mm -hmm. where you can see, like, the wear pattern. And, yeah, it does take a while. It takes a, a good amount of time. It took me probably 
close to a year to be able to get to the point where I could do an entire like maybe three, four miles without reverting back to that old mm-hmm. form. But then once you pick it up, each time you go out, you get better and better. And honestly, for me, that was a game changer. Yeah, that's a good point is that you you start to get the hang of it. And then because you, but you're you're so conscious and aware of it that as soon as you start to relax into your run, mm-hmm. you lose it again. Yeah. So you have to keep bringing it back into your mind to keep doing it until it becomes so natural that that's how you run. And now that's how I run. So a lot of times now, sometimes I'll get two on my toes and then my calves just get super tight. Mm-hmm. And then I have to remember to relax back a little bit and not mm-hmm. to just be always on my toes because then my calves start to burn. So some of the biggest things ever is pacing. Pacing yep. is huge. Um, when people start their two mile run, I used to always laugh because it's like I would sit there and watch the whole group just take off sprint. Yep. Boom. And it's a competition. Started, yeah. And so you would be like, oh, I got to go slow, got to go yeah. slow. And then everybody else takes off and you're like, oh, fuck, maybe yeah. I'm going too slow. Yeah. So they would, because they're taking off sprinting, you would want to keep up and pass people and be in the game and be competitive. So you start throwing your pace out the window. I would always wait back. I purposely let everyone kind of take off, not like wait, but I would do a slower jog mm-hmm. even than my comfortable pace, let everyone move ahead of me and then i would just slowly start taking their souls as they yep. would fall off just picking them off yeah so in sf you you hear people say steal their souls a lot or take their souls and it's just this funny thing that we do it's a mental trick that we all use or most of us use while you're in training while you're in the course to where every time that you're about to pass someone you suck their soul up from them <laughs> and when you take it you get some positive energy yeah from them like you took their positive energy you took their motivation and now uh, you harness that so that way, every time you pass somebody, you like, yep. and then you feel a little better. And it motivates you to keep yeah. going, to yeah. keep going. So these are just some like uh, mind tricks that we, we, everyone in the course like learns to play. Is like, oh, suck your soul, bro. It's like, yeah. Because as soon as I pass you, I'm like, got him, <laughs> you know. And then I feel better. I feel stronger, and that's important selection too. Because when somebody quits, like you don't know if you're doing the right thing. Well, one way to kind of like feel like you are when somebody quits, you're like, oh. That person quit because it was too hard. I haven't yet. Yeah. So I must be doing something right. So when people start quitting, you feel like you're, it's like motivating too. Cause you're like, it was hard, too hard for that person, but I'm still here. Yeah. So maybe I have what it takes. So I started getting motivation off people quitting. But the main thing for me, besides pose running and, and changing my um, form was uh, sprints on the treadmill. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I did this very specific thing where at the end of a run or at the beginning of a run, I would put as high as I can on the treadmill and run as fast as I can for as long as I possibly mm-hmm. could. So I didn't set a time, nothing like that. I just put the speed all the way up to 12, 13, however high it'll go, however fast I could run. And I would dead sprint for as long as possible, whether it's 15 seconds, 30 seconds, if I can get it to a minute. I was just training my lungs to be able to just go, go. So trying to find that new section of lung capacity Mm -hmm. and that helped me develop my speed. Yeah, that that was something I incorporated too. So when it comes to like training and you talk about like running for preparation for two mile and the distances and speeds, that was like part of my plan of what I did, right? So I would train by doing three miles. That's how I trained for my two miles, by doing three miles, right? Because I figured... You know, I'm not a, a runologist or anything like that. So I feel like... Is that a no real s- name for it? A runologist? It is now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, so anyway, so it's like, I don't know the science behind it, but yeah. it worked for me, right? Yeah. So I would train my three for a three-mile run. And if I could do a three-mile run and keep like a seven-minute pace or something mm-hmm. like that, or slightly above that, when it came time for the two-mile, it wasn't hard to bump down or bump up the pace mm-hmm. for a mile shorter. Yeah. And then, so what I would do is I would do these three mile runs, but then I would also incorporate speed work every once in a while, like you were saying, but what I would do is like a 30, 60 interval. So like a 30 second all out max effort sprint, Mm -hmm. then a 60 minute, like super, super slow jog to get that heart rate back down and then do it again. So it's basically like high, high, what is it? High intensity interval training at that Mm -hmm. point, which like you're saying, increases your VO2 max or whatever the scientists call it. You know, and then yeah, the runologist, the whatever, runologist, whatever yeah. runologist would determine it. I'm, I'm a street scientist. <laughs> yeah. And but, so once you do that, though, now when you do it on a two mile, not only are you accustomed to picking up the pace, but mm-hmm. you're also accustomed to running further than the two mile. Mm-hmm. So now that made it a lot easier for me as well. Yeah. And then I always knew one thing that that treadmill sprint taught me was how long I could run without breathing. Like I wouldn't hold my breath, obviously, but when I'm running 
and I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and then I step it up to max and I'm sprinting, I know that I can't maintain that. Mm -hmm. But somehow I'm going and I'm actually making good distance because I'm running so fast. And I'm like, but I'm barely keeping up with my breathing. There's this yeah. transition period when you go from like a stable breathing rate and a stable heart rate to that maxed out. Well, it takes a while to catch up. So you mm -hmm. have a period of time to where you could sprint full out before you're like actually not being able to breathe. And so I would use that. I would say I, could, I know that for a quarter lap, I don't need to breathe. I could dead nut sprint as mm -hmm. fast as I can. So at the end of every PT test, I would pick a spot on the track mm -hmm. that was the last quarter of the of the loop or the last half of the loop. And I would say, fuck it yep. and sprint as fast as I can. I didn't need to breathe. I didn't care how it felt. I just sprinted. A lot of times I would get to the finish line and throw up, but <laughs> I would max my PT test. But that's the kind of things I had to do because like you, like, I'm, I'm not a fast runner. So I would just get, I would go balls to the walls on my two mile and end up vomiting most of them. I never cruised a two mile because I was always afraid I was going to not max it. Yeah. And I'm not fast. So that, like I said, that, that was a technique I used to is like, okay, from that point to the finish line, I don't need to breathe. It's fucking hundred percent sprint as fast as I can. And then I could collapse at the finish line. <laughs> Maybe not the like recommended technique. <laughs> The, the runologist wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, but it's whatever you guys find that works for you for running. So you can go, you can go, you know, gory level where it's like understanding everything about running, understanding the pose positioning, um, pacing. You could do interval training. You, you, know, you could nick bear the shit out of runs and, and constantly have this immaculate workout plan. Or you could just kick your own ass. Right. That's what I did. I just kicked my own ass and ran a lot. I ran the PT test a lot because I hated it. Yep. So one thing is like getting outside and running is huge because if you just try to use your treadmill, like the times don't translate. Well, yeah. And that, and also because, you know, you've got to prepare, it's essentially a race, right? So you need to train in your race day conditions. If you're always training inside, like you have an indoor track or something, yeah. especially once you get to North Carolina, once you step outside and it's like 90% humidity mm -hmm. and like 90 degrees in the morning time, and you start running in that, you're going to be up for a rude awakening, you know, because yeah. it's a completely different game at that point. It's and, so hard to run with that humidity and heat. And, bro, you, you get with all your classmates to go do this PT test, so it's nerve-wracking. Yeah. All the energy is like, it's buzzing around because everyone wants to pass so they can continue their career. And you're and you're just, you're just over here waiting to start, and it's just buzzing energy. Yeah. You got guys who are just super confident because they're just such fast runners. You got the slower guys like, uh, yeah. And then you're trying to figure out with all that adrenaline what to eat so you're not vomiting before mm -hmm. and you're not getting stomach cramps uh, and you're not getting muscle cramps. So that's another thing that you guys need to start figuring out and testing yourself beforehand is how to cope with the anxiety, the stress, what to eat before, how much to drink the day before, how much water to drink. If you're going to drink uh, water before you run or if you're going to drink Gatorade, mm -hmm. all those things matter because if you switch it up before PT test and you don't have it dialed in, you can get cramps, you can yep. get vomiting, you can get stomach cramps and you'll, or shit yourself. Yeah. And then like, yeah. all of a sudden you got, you got like real bad diarrhea pains because you ate something shitty the night before. Yep. So all those things you need to dial in. So every time a PT test is coming, you're like, okay, I did a banana every morning. That's the only thing I would eat before a PT test was a banana just so I didn't feel sick. And it's banana and water. That was like, I can get through a PT test anytime, which is banana water. Mm -hmm. So dial in what you're going to eat. The ultras, and you're about to do an ultra. Mm -hmm. The um, I guess I should sign up for it. <laughs> I was supposed to sign up for it. And I, I forgot to do it. But when I was doing the ultras, it taught me a lot about pacing. It taught me a lot about how to eat uh, properly and, and um, the pose running method. People don't, you learn from ultras how effective pacing could be when you slow it so far down that you're uncomfortable for the first 10 miles because you're running too slow for your mm -hmm. your own comfort level. And that's a cool thing because then you realize, wait, I could slow this way down and go way farther. And then you start to realize how much you could affect it. Because a lot of people just run their comfort level. Yeah. And that pace can only get them so far. Yeah, you can't sustain that the entire race. Right, so they don't realize that, you know, they think they can never sustain running 30 plus miles, but it's like, you can, 
You just need to learn to slow way down. Right. And it's it's harder than you think to slow down because you have a natural rhythm that you want to. Yeah. Run. And that, that's the other thing too, which you touched on earlier about the PT test is whatever your training and whatever you you think your pacing is when you come up with your game plan. Don't let everybody else knock you off of your mm -hmm. game plan. So like you said, trying to jackrabbit out of the start and keep up with people. Just know that you have a plan and you have done it so many times that yep. you know what pace you need to keep. Let them run their own race. Everybody, you're on your own race at that point. You're not racing, you know, to be first place. You're just racing your own race to get the best time for you that you can. Yeah, because they'll, you'll see them hit the wall. They'll take off sprinting and they're taking off running. They're racing each other halfway through one mile in and they hit a wall. Bam. Yep. And it's like they cannot push past that wall. That's what, So we'll end it on this one. The last thing I want to say is the adrenaline dump for me was hitting a wall every PT test. Did you have that? To where it was like I couldn't breathe for a second. The adrenaline mixed with getting my heart rate up. And then... Well, as you're running? When I first started, that first lap. Oh, yeah. And then, right, for me, and then it was like the pain and the burn would set in because I was always chasing the group yeah. and I was outrunning my pace. And then it took me a while to... to calm down yeah. and learn these lessons about running my own race yeah so that was me hitting that wall all the time yeah so you hit that wall and then you just watch them and it's like you have to just get through the adrenaline dump the your heart rate going up because now you're in a race mm -hmm. you're breathing going up learn how to co coach yourself back down to being okay and then focus on racing your race and then go make it happen let everyone else do their thing know your pace you can check your watch whatever know that you're on pace and then the last lap just give it hell. Get everything you got. You 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 don't need to breathe. Through. Everything else you got in the tank, just dump yeah, it all just right there. Dump through. it all. Give everything you got because at the end of the day, even if you're going to pass, wouldn't you rather have a 1250, a 1220, you know, instead of a 1330, 1340? The best time you have, the better for you. It's mm -hmm. always going to look better on you to have the best time. So give it everything you got. That's why I always hated PT tests or two mile runs because I'm giving it everything. Yeah, it's only two miles and it's only like slightly over 10 minutes. It's like yeah. 12, 13 minutes, but it's so draining. Yeah, it's so much it's effort. It everything takes. you have, it's your best two mile. It's not just cruising to pass. So, and that's the mindset you're going to have going through all these gates in selection is you're always trying to give it everything you have, not just get through it and pass. Mm -hmm. So that way, that means like every time there's a physical event, it's, the most difficult thing you've ever done because you're giving it all you every ounce of energy you got so hope that helps guys it's good to see you good to talk to you about different uh sfas topics we're not going anywhere when it comes to helping you guys get selected for uh, special forces we are doing the mentor program which you don't have to be going sfas uh to do you could we got guys from uh three going trying to go three letter agencies guys from foreign militaries and it's one-on-one -on -one mentorship to try and coach you through uh, whatever your goal is. And then we have group settings and then we have the extra channel. Um, we also have the online store. We just dropped the Ruck Trainer. Those sold out within seven, eight so, hours. Yeah, seven and a half hours. Seven and a half hours, all the Ruck Trainers sold out. So that's the pre-sale. Once those are done, we'll get those shipped. And then we'll do another run of 20. And then by then, hopefully we'll have a U.S. Uh, manufacturing all our own parts. So that way we're not looking for um, resold uh, U.S. auction uh, Molly 2 Rucks because that is hard. It's like finding needles in a haystack <laughs> to find 80 Molly 2 rucksacks on auction. Yeah. And then you have to go travel. I, we had to go to Vegas to get these rucksacks. And then like, you got to inspect them. And yeah, then we got to inspect them and then we had to argue and then we had to you know, get some money back because some of them were up to standard. It's just a whole nightmare. So the sooner we can manufacture our own, the better, but we're in the process of that. Um, so yeah, we are doing everything we can to help you guys get selected, bringing you the products, bringing you the uh, mentorship, the guidance and free content as well. So we'll see you on the next one. If your dream has become a Green Beret, then you need all the help you can get. We have an upcoming seminar held by Green Berets in San Antonio, Texas on November 12th. We will break down exactly what you need to be preparing for, the mental aspects, the physical aspects, and make sure that you have everything you need to get selected the first time. We'll work on team building exercises and make sure that you guys know the importance of working together as a team and what is expected of you in SFAS.